you so much for joining today's webinar. I hope you're feeling well. Um, and if you're not feeling as good as you might like to, I you can come up with some ideas. You feel great longer term and also think about how your colleagues might be feeling to help them. So just introducing myself, um, my name is Lucinda. I know many of you will know me, so you can read through this to yourself. Uh, if you uh, like self-development and haven't come across the podcast I host, you might be interested in the HR Uprising podcast that I host. We've done more than 100 episodes, so there's bound to be something of use to you. Uh, the most recent one this week was how to run a remote, uh, remote appraisal, which of course is quite topical at the moment. Um, so in terms of today's session, the main learning outcomes or topics that I want to cover really in this session, it's it, the title is long term strategies, because, of course, we've been through a long term period where we've tipped in and out of um, how do we react to our well-being in the short term. And now for many of us, certainly in the UK and also to my own people, I'm not sure whether you're in the same position as us. So in the UK this week, it's just been announced that we're going to come out of lockdown sustained period of time so from the 12th of April we can start to do a little bit more go into restaurants and meet people outside and it's going to go on until June so we're basically gradually coming out of lockdown and we've been given dates uh, in terms of our international people who perhaps have got different rules let us know in the chat what your rules are are you in lockdown are you not in lockdown because um, some of this I guess may relate to that but I suppose the tone of what I'm talking about here is as thinking about longer term well-being, both as individuals and I know many of you will be HR. In fact, let me know, are you HR? Are you learning and development? Are you a line manager? Tell us in the chat your role um, that you're, um, you're, you're here in what hat you've got on, I guess, also as yourself, but also are you here to help others? So. What we're going to look at is more about not just in the moment well-being, which the sessions that I've done similarly on this before, it's been more about in the moment, maybe the tactical well-being. This is about maybe longer term resilient strategies and habits. So with that, we're going to look at things about taking responsibility and control, how we can choose our mindset, positive habits we can get into and top tips for ourselves and others. Now, what I would say is. There's nothing I'm going to share with you, which is unique rocket science. Um, it's lots of stuff that I, I've accumulated over the years. I've been through my books. I've got into Blinkist, if any of you have come across that, which I've been through about three or four resilience books, actually, which you can cheat and get through them really, really quickly. Um, and some of this also, if you're familiar with The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is a book that I often mention because I was lucky enough to be a trainer in it um, in my 20s, and it's got some brilliant principles in it. So some of this will be familiar, but I hope still it will be practical and useful to you. Now, as ever, thanks, I can see we have got lots of HR, um, HR L&D people, so lots of multiple hats. So you've got your own hat on and other hats on there, wellbeing ambassadors um, and people just here with their own interests. So you're really, really welcome. That's great. It's lovely to know the sort of tone of people. As you probably know, I do try to make these interactive and polls are quite a good thing on Zoom that allow us to do that. So I'm going to launch um, the first poll and it's totally anonymous so you can be truthful. And this poll is asking you to tell us how are you feeling basically in yourself? Are you feeling great? Are you feeling pretty good? Are you feeling a bit up and down, middling, if that's different, a little fed up or not good? So just be honest, it'd be good to get a temperature check. And that's more about how you're feeling in yourself. And the second one is how do you feel about coming out of lockdown? Um, because I, I do think that we might think, oh, it's great, but actually, does everybody feel that way? Um, it's quite likely that some people will have actually mixed feelings about it. Um, we've got used to this a certain way of life. And let's say, face it, there are some upsides um, to not commuting, for example. So interested to get a sense um, of who we've got on here and how you feel. And we've got 140 odd people, so 70% of you've managed to vote. So that's brilliant. I'll share the results in a moment. Nearly up to 80%. Yeah, it's interesting. Yes. Um, and if you've got any context that you want to add in, please feel free to add them in. Great to have um, mental health first aider here. Hi, Janine. That's great to, to have that. OK, so we've got nearly 90 percent voting. So if anyone else wants to vote, just quickly go now and then I'll share. That's great numbers. So we've got 127 people. I'm going to three, two, one. I will. Oh, and that's there you go. OK, so let me share the results so you can see how you feel. So 
What's interesting, isn't it? It's a normal, normal, normal distribution, isn't it? Again, so actually, some of you are feeling great, and almost an equal number of you are feeling not good. Um, thank you for your honesty, and uh, that's interesting, isn't it? So, um, for everybody here, if you're feeling great, we need to know that there's probably an equal number of us who are not feeling great, and vice versa. If you're not feeling great, some people are feeling all right, so not everyone's in the same position. But certainly we can see there's a huge range of emotions to how people feel and this fluctuation, this up and down by far the majority of people, this 39% of people are fluctuating and that's been a common theme. We've probably run a similar poll throughout this um, over the course of the uh, last 12 months and fluctuating has been a really, really common theme. Uh, if, if you are happy to share in the chat, what is it if there's any context to your fluctuation? Is it just day to day or is it, um, you know, homeschooling versus not having to commute? Are there certain ups and downs or certain things that make it easier or less easy to do it? How do you feel about coming out of lockdown? That question there is most people are all right, but there's quite a few people feeling mixed. I think I actually think I maybe feel a bit mixed about it. I think I felt and I think I like change. So it slightly surprises me about it um, because I feel that uh, there's lots of bits I quite like. I'm quite liking not having to go into London um, and, you know, it'd be nice to go and see some friends and stuff and be a little bit less boring uh, at weekends. But then again, it's become very simple, hasn't it, life? But actually lots of people are feeling optimistic which is great but there are also a significant proportion of us who are going to be feeling a bit anxious as well so this is likely to be representative of how the people that we support are going to feel so we've got a whole range of people that um I have these views. Let's just have a look and see if there's any context that's come through. Working with children in the house. So Sarah, you're looking forward to the eighth and I'm imagining um, here. Blurred lines at the start and end of the day, longer hours under more pressure. It's interesting, Kim, isn't it? So I took half term off last week and a few people I spoke to, they said it really has made a difference, even though not going anywhere, just not working. So having a break has been good um, for people. Missing the office and not missing the office, says Simon. So yeah, so not being able to see family for such a long time yes says manuela focus on motivations harder uh, okay so if you haven't got a strategy don't worry that's interesting not having a strategy not having goals and that's one of the things in terms of remote line management helping people there so all of these are our reason yes yeah, so these pros and cons and reasons people other emotional reasons physical reasons shanine all this sort of stuff that's going on and anxiety so yeah lovely okay so thanks for sharing there's all these different things that people are missing and all these things it, the whole piece about covid i suppose it's, it's shown that we all live individual lives but we, they said this analogy about we're all in the same storm but we're not necessarily all in the same boat so people have got different experiences um which are, will be affecting how they feel so so that's just good for us to get a temperature check isn't it so we can all take something away from this and we can all help other people because they'll be feeling a similar way so you might have seen a similar slide that i've shared before when i've done a well-being um, presentation but i'm drawing this out more to do with well-being and re resilience but the thing to remember about mental health and i know i've got experts on here in terms of mental health first aiders is for us always to remember that it's something that we all have levels of mental health like physical health and it can fl fluctuate as we're seeing from this score here based on the um, on our levels of resilience so it can it can fluctuate um, and i think the reality and the concern that I have is the sustained pressures that many people have been through that may well have depleted our health, well-being and resilience. And I don't know if this resonates with anybody, but I have a sense that, you know, if you're under sustained stress, it's, it's almost like the analogy where you can put up a lot of stress at work and then you have a holiday and then you become ill. It's almost like your immune system's holding things off, holding things off, holding things off. Your adrenaline's holding things off. And as soon as you let go, then almost it all crashes down. Um, and I'm not saying that is the case, but I feel that's where we need to be really mindful of our resilience and the resilience of others, that suddenly releasing lockdown is not going to be a magical, um, you know, it's not going to be a magical improvement. There's still going to be repercussions for people. There are repercussions for people in terms of their family and in terms of, um, you know, the things that people have experienced. So the ongoing, our need to focus on resilience long term, I think is really important. And prevention is better than cure when it comes to mental health. And this I've made before that 
um, often things like depression and anxiety and, and serious mental health, pro health problems, they all, it becomes almost like the straw that breaks the camel's back. So if we don't find ways of alleviating stress, of finding relief, then what can happen is we fall into a dark hole and it's really, really hard to get out of. So this dark black hole we need to avoid. And therefore a lot of what I'm talking about here is how can we just be mindful of the fact we might think we're doing great, but actually we're fluctuating. So how do we make sure that we're more on the up or we're very good at bouncing up that resilience and that rebounding up so it's how can we create habits of self-care to keep our resilience levels topped up and protect our well-being and those of people we work with for the long term so that's um that's what we're, we're talking about here and the black hole is my point about trying not to fall into it in terms of obviously I'm going to share some ideas that I've got for avoiding falling into my black hole of of depression um any of you guys what are you doing tell so you tell us what you are doing to um protect yourselves in terms of managing your resilience Janine says it's hard to switching off miss the you miss the commute home where you can put some music on so it's having that point and sing at the top of my lungs to clear your head so that's interesting Janine isn't it so is there a way, I know I've heard some people saying where you can almost put a pretend commute in. So is that possible? I don't, it might not be if you've got very young children, um, but is there a way in which you can do it? Sea swimming, couch to 5K says Nina. Are you out sea swimming already? Hardcore if you are. So we've got some great ideas coming through. These are people's resilience strategies and we'll see some of these ideas will work for you as well. Keep a routine in the morning. Absolutely, Les, that's something that's really worked for me um, that I've been doing that. So I'll, I'll keep an eye on those. The point is really, it's about as making sure that we've got resilience building strategies and we encourage those in the people that we work with for long-term well-being. Just because we've spelt, spent 12 months um, you know, seeing into people's homes, even if we end up going back in the office, we still need to encourage people to have better long-term habits and to have those ourselves because this kind of sense of um, this challenging sort of environment we've been, we've been in, it's not going to go away overnight. Um, we're not automatically going to go back to the way we were, and there's going to be fallout from it. So what we need to do is encourage people to look up and forwards. I think it's how can we help people to do that rather than down and back. When you look at this, something I've read about um, difference between stress and anxiety, it's often about overthinking. Anxiety is, is um, often internal overthinking is where we go quite introspective. So we're going inwards um, and overthinking and worrying about things. Stress is more outwards. So you can actually potentially think about stuff and deal with it. But fundamentally, it's how can we rather than dwell on perhaps things we think we've done wrong or things we're concerning about it's how can we look up and forwards and look in an optimistic create those optimistic thinking habits so what are the sort of strategies we've got and you're putting some brilliant things there oh headspace on netflix is it says Janine. um so how can you actually build resilience or grit and absolutely meditation is something that's good um Iglica is saying speaking to friends regularly doing yoga all of these are really really great and, and writing times down says kelly animal crossing <laughs> love it um i i was sort Call of Duty. I keep getting what it's called, Call of Duty, run by my son the other day. Um, I, I almost managed to use the, and I, I can't remember, I was going to say joystick, that's wrong, isn't it? Controller. Controller. They'd be so shamed this is recorded. Um, this uh, They'd be mortified at my uh, saying that. Anyway, building resilience or grit. The key principles here, um, and these come from lots of sources, are how we can make sure that we're taking responsibility for our feelings about things and our thoughts. So we take ownership and responsibility, focusing on things we can control, using some of reframing our challenges, so it's a way of thinking differently, practicing gratitude, that also links into things like mindfulness, creating positive habits, and focusing on elements of achievement and purpose. So these are the, the six themes, if you like, that I'm just going to highlight some points on that can be helpful to us. So this first one here is all about taking responsibility. And um, I alluded to Seven Habits. Um, he talks about this book that he talked about there, which is Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. So Viktor Frankl was someone who was, um, he was taken into the concentration camps and he was, he saw his family and friends die around him. He made various observations about the difference in human nature between people who were still kind, whatever the circumstances. And um, a bit like Terry Waite, if you ever heard of that, that um, Terry Waite, who was a hostage for a really long time. One of the things that kept him sane was the fact that he always had a view on the future. He was able to 
keeping keep an eye on how he was going to go forwards into the future and always had a vision of how he would teach his learnings which he wrote into this book he would teach them to students in future and that was one of the things that's kept him sane he had the same sort of thing about nelson mandela who was 27 years in a concentrate in, in um on robin island so this and victor frankl of course was in the concentration camp so in those circumstances, I think it actually is quite a leveler when you think of any of those, which is giving me goosebumps that, you know, 12 months of us being locked up at home um, due to a, a pandemic isn't actually comparable to quite a lot of those as individual challenges. Um, it doesn't mean we've not had a hard time, but the fact that certain people have been able to control their thought, they've taken responsibility for their mindset and they haven't let them go down a negative spiral. They've focused instead on positive future vision of things they'd like in the future. And they've also focused on things they can control. So the Viktor Frankl stories, he could control very little. He was being experimented on, but what he could control was he would escape into his head and focus on his mindset. And what that means, and this is quite tough stuff, I'm not saying it's easy at all, um, but it's about us maybe losing the victim mentality if we have it, or if we're working with people who have that victim mentality, it's about gently supporting them to take responsibility. Um, and, and often people who have like a victim mentality, they're people who they would always see the blame as somewhere else. So there's always a reason why they can't do something. You might suggest something of helpful, you know, you could do something in the morning. Well, I can't do that because as opposed to saying I'm choosing not to do that because it's a bit too difficult because my kids are there. It's um, they would always say I can't or I won't. There's quite negative self-talk going on. So if you hear yourself use I can't do, it's about reframing that into okay I could do it if I really wanted to but I'm choosing not to that's taking responsibility so let's say I can't exercise in the morning because I've got young kids well let's face it I could get up an hour earlier um, and do it if I wanted to but I don't want to right I don't want to I'm taking responsibility now that is a bit of a bitter pill to swallow taking responsibility because you can't blame anyone else but it's also empowering as soon as we take responsibility for the fact we are making a choice about how we're behaving then that also gives us a choice to choose otherwise so it's difficult you have to be quite a strong character um, and I'm imagining that many of you already think like this but it's the sort of thing that how you could gently if you're working with someone in, you know in the workplace who's got into that sort of blame and they are quite depressed and anxious you know saying don't be a victim isn't going to help but what you can say is is there anything you can do what tiny thing can you do and this links into this idea of controlling what you can control so um sorry my mouse has decided not to work this again comes from covey's work and on the outside we've got this circle of concern and then we've got our circle of influence and in the center we've got our circle of control so the reality is there's loads of things that can concern us and at the moment there's been so many things for people to get anxious about and anxious people will be spending a lot of time focusing in their circle of concern the problem about the focusing in the circle of concern is that actually it's only bits of the circle of concern that you can either influence or control that are really worth focusing on because they're the only things you can do anything about I saw, um, again, I heard on a podcast, a, a psychiatrist talking about how they could help people who are feeling very anxious. And, uh, and she said, essentially, it's all about focusing on what you can control, this whole thing about tidying or whatever. She said, you know, even if the only thing in your life you can control, like you know, Mandela or Victor Frankl's mindset, is your sock drawer, and she said, just control the hell out of your sock drawer. You know, make it the best, most tidy, pristine sock drawer or... I don't know, pantry or fridge or whatever it might be, control whatever it is and focus on those things. You can then move out to the things that you can influence. And then ultimately, really um, effective people can just work around the edge of things that they influence. And the more we work around the things that we influence, maybe by influencing other people around us, the more we can actually expand our circle of influence. And by doing that, it makes our circle of concern smaller. So if ever we feel overly anxious or we're with people who are overly anxious and they're worrying about things that frankly they can't do a lot about, again, it's gently, okay, so is there anything about that that you can even slightly influence just a little bit? And as soon as we focus our energy on things that we can influence, then we start to feel better. We start to feel stronger and more empowered. Again, this is about mindset. It's about us reflecting on how we think naturally as a default. Um, and that might be about us practicing reframing situations. We've all heard about people who have sort of negative um, 
situations who have you know, the half the glass half empty half full type um, mindset and some people are just naturally more optimistic or or, or you know negative my dad used to say if he was pessimistic he would uh, at least he couldn't be disappointed um, but being purely pessimistic in the sort of environment we're in isn't terribly hopeful and it can again spiral down so what we can just do is, is choose what can I focus on what if what if this did do well actually um, am I worrying about something that might never happen? So that's where things like mindfulness that you're talking about and um, just focusing the present even is a good way of doing things. But you can always reframe a difficult situation. Um, I, there, was, there were people talking originally when we said we had to stay at home, people were saying, oh, um, you know, rather than, I can't remember what the adage was, but it was basically be safe, be at home, as opposed to be in fear or that side of things. Any difficult situation you have, you can always look at a way in which you can reframe it. There is always an upside to it if you look hard enough. Um, and, you know, I, I've had situations in my personal life when, um, when I lost my father, you know, he died very, very suddenly of, of a stroke, um, which is, you know, that's a, a pretty pretty dreadful and shocking situation it was the upside of that was the fact that he did die quite quickly of a stroke and he was um he was a doctor and he would have absolutely have hated to have been paralyzed and been a vegetable my mum had dementia and that would have been a nightmare if I'd had both of them um in the situation so it's never great to lose somebody but under the circumstances actually there was something to be taken from it of, of an upside so that's an extreme example but often you know we get into situations where we go oh it's all it's all terrible yeah, okay well it could be worse because how can we stop ourselves and reframe it you know what is the upside to this situation on the positive side we've just lost a key customer well on the positive side they were a right pain and at least i don't have to deal with them anymore right something like that so there's often things that we can um deal with or we could learn about this. Uh, Liz is saying in suggestions to influence people about mindfulness and gratitude when they think it might be too fluffy. I'll come back to that one, Liz, because I'm going to get fluffier yet. So we're going to have to come up with that. So anyone on here, um, apologies in terms of I'm quite practical, but um, I'm, this, this is going into fluffy land. So um, I, I'm interested as to other people. Um, Simon's saying taking responsibility, losing victim mentality is a great approach as a leader manager. It's a real challenge, though, a real challenge because some people have a really entrenched victim mentality. Um, my kids uh, now actually say don't be a victim if anyone doesn't take responsibility in the house so it's uh, quite funny try the gratitude habit so as Liz said so gratitude mindfulness and gratitude honestly I think if you'd mentioned this to me a year ago I'd have gone oh no this is a bit oh but I'm I'm sharing this because it really genuinely helped me in November so in November the second lockdown you know it was darkness I was feeling the monotony I forced myself to get out in the morning and I was listening to um, a particular audio of this person who was going through a book called The Magic and it was all about um, visioning and being and gratitude now whether or not you believe in universe or creating future or not it doesn't really matter to be honest that is irrelevant for this what I found was getting up and out of the house every morning with the dogs so creating a habit which people said earlier creating a habit um, which involved exercise so some endorphins and fresh air that in itself was really helpful and as I went out there I was doing this thing which you were saying a part of this gratitude habit was find 10 things that you are grateful for at the start of the day and even if it is I'm so grateful that I have got wellies that I can stomp around in this mud with the key about the gratitude thing which I hadn't come across before which was which was quite useful you know I, I said how grateful I was that I actually had a park walking distance from my house so that I can get exercise really easily how grateful I am that um, I'm safe in a safe environment that I could go out on my own at six o'clock in the morning which um, you know other people can't the whole point of it is actually saying why you're grateful for it as well so actually you feel positive about it now whether you think that's woo woo or not doesn't really matter the reality is if you are saying 10 positive things you can't be thinking negative things and what previously I'd have done on dog walk I might have been listening to something a podcast but I might have been worrying or thinking oh I've got to do that so what it was just doing is is just reprogramming myself to be positive and you know and that's just a good habit it's just good practices like exercising my mind to think about positives so so Whatever, wherever you take from that, all I say is practically, you can't be thinking about negative things while you're thinking about positive things. So it is worth trying. 
and actually um, there's a huge amount of thing where gratitude it, it, yeah they are superpowers for lots of people uh, there's way may well be lots more to it but if you're someone who's a bit cautious about that kind of thing from a very pragmatic viewpoint it's worth it from a point of view doing some exercise you're feeling positive oh and by the way if you can exercise in the morning I mean who's not winning at life if you've done some exercise before 7 30 in the morning you've got to feel proud of yourself right so then let's look at positive habits and how we can do this um i like in that day fluffy land so how can we create positive habits it doesn't have to all be about gratitude there are other things so i have some ideas here and i've divided them into four quadrants again um with gratitude to Stephen Covey, who talks about sharpening the saw and renewal. And he talks about renewal in four quadrants, physical, mental, emotional, and he talks about spiritual as the fourth one. Now, spiritual doesn't land with every culture as well as it does in America. So I've renamed that mindful, but if you, if for it's spiritual and religion fits in there really strongly, if that's something that is, um, is, is for you. So, what we're really saying is we want balance in life so actually we need to think about having positive habits and if you think back to what habits you had 12 months ago you may or may not have done any of these maybe you do more than you did 12 months ago and if you do when we go back to normal we need to carry on doing it so physical well-being you know we need to get some level of exercise ideally outside we can while we are working remotely if you are it is easy to eat well it's easy to eat badly, but it's easier. You could have a smoothie in the morning. You could make sure you've got a really healthy you know, lunch. You're not having to go and buy stuff and you know, grab a sandwich from the corner. Um, we can choose to drink lots of water, not, dr not drink too much alcohol or coffee, um, because of course that links to sleep. Sleep is probably the most important thing in terms of our well-being, and we've probably all experienced that. So if you physically, we are doing things that are gonna help us sleep well, you do, you, we're doing a great starter. So first, are we doing things there? But then it's not just physical, it's mental stuff, because many of us are mentally exhausted because you can't get away from the desk. So things like reading for fun, um, you know, novels, learning an instrument. Any of you tried these apps? I used to play the piano when I was like 12. I wasn't very good. And me and my son have started playing Simply Piano. I've, I'm way better than I've ever been. And I've actually started enjoying it. Who would, who would have thought that? That's a gift of lockdown. Um, Jigsaws, colouring, loads of friends of mine are doing the colouring paint by numbers, learning language. So things that we can do that we wouldn't have done before. We'd be too busy being busy. Emily, it's recorded. We've got it recorded. Um, emotional is connecting with family and friends, watching funny TV, laughing about stuff, being careful about not just listening to Boris day in, day out. Because let's face it, you, you're not hearing that much news. You'll get most of it through social media um, in a you know, few minutes. Talk about how you feel with people, spend time with pets and connecting. Those are great ways to feel emotionally connected. And then mindful is about things like meditation. So we've heard that um, Headspace is now on, was it Headspace is, is on Netflix. Um, demonstrating gratitude, we've talked about connecting with nature, practicing your religion, do something kind for others. So we've got four quadrants there. And in terms of a second poll, I thought I'd ask you whether or not um, which your quadrant is your strongest quadrant and which may, may be your, the one that you'd like to do more of. So let me just get that live for you. So in terms of our positive habits, just launching that now, choose the quadrant that you think you're currently strongest in. So you'd give yourself, yep, yeah, thumbs up. I'm, I'm doing quite well in that one. And maybe choose one that you think this weekend you're going to do some more in. Maybe you can do something else because the point is, actually for us to be resilient the reason i'm sharing this is that for us to be resilient long term we need to have positive habits in all of these quadrants and we need to encourage that with our the people that we work with and for ourselves i'm going to let you carry on voting that while i carry on to my next slide so those are thoughts about um, habits and certainly it's been good for me to stretch myself out of the norm. We've had to find different ways of meeting those. The other way in which um, I think we can help ourselves feel a sense of well-being and resilience is about seeking small achievements and finding purpose in what we're doing. So one of those is about setting and achieving small goals. So getting things where you do, you know, even if you say I am going to, I'm, I'm going to um, tidy the cutlery drawer this weekend and go wow I'm really pleased with myself for doing that or I'm going to get up early and do some yoga um, at six o'clock in the morning and I get up and do that it's a great way for you to build your own 
self-confidence and self-esteem is by making the keeping small commitments to yourself if you're not going to do it don't make the commitment because that's basically taking away from your self-belief so set and achieve small goals and recognize yourself for doing it think about just finding that moment this is all about mindfulness um which i must say i do find hard the meditation piece but finding purpose and meaning in your day-to-day -day life so where you are spending time with friends or family and realizing actually that's what life is about in many ways just generally being kind to yourself and others so having that sense of achievement and feeling purpose in terms of what you're doing which is important so if you value your family your friends your work recognizing that those things are positive that they really really help so on to my um, final tips here for us about encouraging resilience in our others. And this is where I'm keen to read down your chat as well, which is always some great stuff in the chat. And also, if anyone's got questions from uh, Liz's question, suggestions to influence people who might want to try things like mindfulness and gratitude where they think it might be too fluffy. How do we how do we um, convince the non fluffies to do things, things that are practical? Well, I think there's quite a lot of evidence about mindfulness. There's things like there's quite a lot of scientific evidence about mindfulness and things like Kundalini yoga. I know that there's some podcasts being talked about on here. There is a podcast a name I can't remember now, but it'll come back to me. Um, uh, it's a doctor, it's a GP, and he talks a lot about well-being. Um, things and an evidence-based practice essentially. I'll try and find the name of the podcast I'm thinking of and put it in our email that comes out. But how can we encourage resilience in others? Um, it is about us being open so people don't feel alone. So look, going back to these slides where we sort of saw that chat, lots and lots of people are feeling up and down so making sure that people don't feel alone they're not they don't need to suffer in silence often quite anxious and depressed people feel like they are alone and actually if they realize that you know strong you who looks like you're always upbeat and confident actually has some real wobbles that's quite helpful for people to know one of the things that this is acting as a coach the reality is you can't tell people to try gratitude or try meditation you can lead by example and you can share in what i hope maybe i practical way in which I said this just worked for me um, and people might if they hear it in another way you think okay that's practical enough it's not too fluffy um, you can also help people by acting as coaches and being a coach is quite a key way for helping people step out of victim mentality but you have to be patient and some people are really invested in being victims so they have to want to change I do recommend um, seven habits actually the whole concept of taking responsibility um, is quite a key point there in terms of um, helping people recognize if they are playing the victim but asking open questions so what is it that you can do how can you can take responsibility is there anything you can influence um you know what specifically could you do differently if you were to be in that situation again how would you change it if i could wave a magic wand um you know what would you do first thing in the morning um that would make you feel good or how would you, you know how would your day go it would make which would manage your well-being any of those sort of things which are all very positive but you're forcing the person to think for themselves there was a point made earlier i think it's by emily who's just gone about having strategy and goals it's quite hard for people to know what's expected of them in the workplace and at home if they don't have clear goals and it's hard to feel positive about achieving something if you didn't have a goal in the first place so help people with work goals maybe talk to them if they've got separate you know well-being goals being predictable and consistent is the most important thing as a manager. Being inconsistent is a great way to make people feel anxious. So um, that means we have to be, although we might be open about our own challenges, we can't allow that to make us inconsistent in our management style. Helping people see um, how organisational purpose links with what their job it is that they do and the deliverables, helping people see meaning in their work is a massively important point to do with engagement, but it also helps people realise that what they're doing is purposeful. So bringing lots of people that say if they're isolated and then they've not got their family close by, and that might be where their sense of purpose is normally, could find purpose through their work if they can see how important it is. So helping people to feel that those things are connected. Obviously avoid blame. And I'm thinking about this in a, in a work environment. Try not to allow um, a culture of blame. If people get things wrong, say, fine, what, what do we need to learn about this? I clearly you don't want people to, make, to get, get things wrong on a regular basis, but the key is make it a learning point rather than a blame, uh, you know, a big disaster. It's like, fine, there was a reason why that person did that. Let's learn from it so it doesn't happen again. So whole learning culture rather than blame culture. Um, and I would say encourage, expect, slash recognize 
positive habits so that quadrant we've just looked at in your team talk to people about what they're doing about their own mental well-being and resilience and you know take they need to take responsibility we all do we all do but actually that is going to make a massive difference to um their effectiveness at work actually if you think about it um but if we can help people look after themselves we are going to be more effective purposeful happy less absence all of those things so it's all interconnected so um I've got my and my end slide is of course that what sort of things can you do love to hear what plans you are going to do or are already doing I can see there's some great tips that are in the chat so I will look at those and I know some more will come through um, my colleague Caitlin is going to pop into the chat some links so we've got this link here for how to prioritize self-care which is one of the podcasts I did and it's also got a worksheet you can download um, in fairness, we can we'll stick it we'll we'll ping an email out to you tomorrow, which will send the link to this video. It'll have the slides um, and then any of these links on here that you can grab as well. So we've got a whole host of well-being resources that you can um, access. One of them that's really nice though that um, we have a, a, a summary sheet which has got loads of well-being resources on it. So if you're a mental health first aider or somebody um, in the organisation hasn't seen it before, we've got a, a, a form that's got lots of lots of um, resources that you can access which are really quite nice. So those are wellbeing resources that we've done before. In terms of future webinars, um, just in terms of what we what our next one is in March. So it's about virtual performance management. So for managers, how can we manage performance better? It's really about the cycle of management, setting goals, the stuff we're talking about, clear goals, etc. Um, regular conversations. If anyone's trying to redesign your appraisal process, we've rescheduled that to what works, what the evidence is around appraisal processes, if that's something that's more aimed at HR people. Um, we've got various remote management training programs which are kicking off again actually they've been really successful so I run those regularly um, change superhero training so all of these you can look at these are things that are available and also one thing just to mention that you may not have seen come out which is brand new is um, we have a brand new Actus Academy which is an on-demand learning platform so if you have people that you're supporting and you don't want you haven't got let's say you've not got an LMS but you don't want to buy an LMS you don't want to buy courses that's just got it's kind of off the shelf e-learning and some video managers so we'll put some links on if any of that's of use or interest so let me look at your top tips and also I'm sure people will need to drop off if anyone does need to drop off please feel they can um, Caitlin has going to drop a feedback form into the chat if you don't mind doing that so yes um, the slides will come over tomorrow so Joe's asked will the slides come over yes we will send you an email tomorrow from my colleague Caitlin which will have the slides and all these links in it um, so that will uh, all of this will come out to you on an email so you don't need to worry about it um, if you can take a moment to um, pop the uh, pop the uh, feedback in that would be great so we've got people, Mrs. Hinch's to-da list. Oh yeah, to-da instead of a to-do list. Shanine, yeah, I came across that recently. I actually heard it on the Squiggly Careers podcast, to-da to-do thing. That's quite good, isn't it? So let's see, we've got some tips on podcasts here. Seven Habits Changed My Life. I love it and teach it. There is a teenage version. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is brilliant. I don't know if it's still run as a training course, but it was one of the most powerful um, pieces of training I ever was involved with. I was really pleased to be in part of it. Um, let's have a look. I love it. So Kim goes for a walk with a colleague and friend even remotely. So you go for virtual walks together at the same time and chat over WhatsApp. Brilliant. Start the day. Really nice. And accountability. But yes, because of course you're getting up and you've got the same time. Nice. You're doing Sarah's doing that with her sister. How do you keep up with the, these good habits? You're good at setting a morning routine, but I can't keep it up for more than a couple of days in a row, Rachel. I think accountability has made a difference for me doing things in the morning. There is something also about making sure I go to bed at the right time and look after myself in the evening. Um, and maybe don't overset it as well. Don't try it, maybe not every day, but go, I'm going to do this on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday and be really happy with that because then it, you know, it takes energy to be, to have resources, um, to be disciplined all the time. So, and then you rebel against it sometimes. So maybe you don't need to do it two days in a row, Rachel. Maybe your goal is to do it every other day or three days a week. Could you achieve that? Um, that's more achievable. Um, Kelly's saying, don't feel people, people are turning a blind eye. So Kelly's saying, what could you do to influence that, do you think, in your organization? Because the problem with that is it feels like it's storing stuff up, doesn't it, for the future? Sleep stories on the calm map, helpful to get people off to sleep. Yeah, that's really, really good. 
lots of can you send slides out oh three new recipes a week from your new vegan cookbook um ah oh, this is how not to die i know it doesn't sound like it sounds a bit depressing that's a vegan cookbook by this guy who runs an evidence-based podcast um dr dr michaelson and it's brilliant it's all about food and and um healthy food which is great. Anyone's got any other um, questions? Um, I'll think a little bit more. Any other questions, please feel free. Any other tips? Um, do get on and look after yourselves and encourage other people to look after themselves. Uh, recommend the seven habits if you're not familiar with it. Um, definitely. And that's, uh, and I'm just thinking if, in terms of influencing other people, I think you can only really lead by example in terms of influencing other people. That would be my take. You can ask people what they want to do. It's a bit like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force them to do it. Um, and other things in terms of influencing, actually, I did a podcast on influencing skills, which is linked on the Daniel Goleman influencing. That's not um, Leontione influencing. And it is about things like helping people have a vision for why they might want to do something. So gratitude third party evidence so if there's someone if there's someone like a, a um a sports star so let's say um a, an amazing rugby player yeah this person's very bright and they think don't do fluffy stuff but they think that martin johnson's the best thing since sliced bread and you know clearly he's hard but they find out that martin johnson is an avid meditator or practices gratitude then that's the sort of thing that probably would be more convincing so it's finding someone um some evidence that from someone that they would see they would look up to that might be a way in which you can do it there's an old adage of making it their idea of course anyway i feel like i'm rambling on so thank you so much for joining us um look out for the slides um i will probably convert this into a podcast episode as well um and i say if you want to remind yourself of influencing styles there is a podcast on the hr uprise on influence styles oh thanks julie that's really nice. um brilliant i think Caitlin, did you pop the feedback form in? I didn't see it. There's so many chats. So uh, hopefully the feedback form's in there. If you can take two minutes to do that, it'll be a Google Doc. That's really, really easy. And um, we look forward to seeing you on a future podcast. One of the things about the feedback doc is it's, ask, um, it's asking you for what you'd like us to cover in future webinars as well. So if you've got topics you'd like me to cover, then that would be great. Thank you for joining. I'm going to, oh, here's the feedback form. So you can grab that form there, the Google Doc, if you've got two minutes and if you've got anything you want us to do in a future webinar, then that would be brilliant. Um, do let us have those ideas because I always try to make them. It's good to have some fresh ideas. Um, and that's why I'm very grateful for you for being so um, interactive in the chat. It's always great to look back on and there's always some brilliant ideas. I love it when you end up chatting to each other within the chat as well and networking off the back of the chat, which is absolutely fantastic. Lovely. So thank you for joining and um, I will close this down in a moment. <laughs>